So good. Well, I want to welcome everybody today, whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online. We love the fact that we get to be one church in multiple, many locations. And I also want to take a moment to, to welcome all the men and women joining us in our correctional ministry out of Lucas County Corrections in the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio. We love you guys. We believe in you. Come on, D-Town. Hey, welcome our church family today. So good. Well, today we are in week number four of our series called Builders, where we've been studying different uh, people throughout the Bible who built the kingdom of God. And we're basically saying, what can we learn from their story? And today I, I want to talk to us about building the local church together. Building the local church together. In fact, the, the title of the message today is, it takes all of us. It takes all of us. In fact, go ahead and look to the, at the person next to you and tell them we need you. Come on, tell them we need you. Because the truth is, it's not me, it's not ye, it's we, right? We're, God's called us to build the local church together, and the truth is, it's going to take all of us in order to do it. Now, you might ask yourself, why is this so important? Why is building the local church so important? And I would answer that by telling you that the local church is the hope of the world. With everything happening in our world today, we talked about it in worship, man. What the world needs now is a church to rise up and be all that God has called and created it to be, right? The local church is, is the hope of the world. Now, now, you might say, well, I thought Jesus was the hope of the world, and he absolutely is the hope of the world, but how many of us know he has, he has a body? He has a body called the local church, the body of Christ, and I want us to, to really understand that it was God's plan, it was God's idea to, to build the local church. In fact, it was God's idea to use broken and flawed and messed up people like you and me to showcase the grace of Jesus to a world that's desperate for redemption. It, it's God's idea. This was God's plan, the local church. And because of that, man, this needs to be something that's important to us. This needs to be something that is a priority to us. It's vital for us to gather together and build the local church together. But it's going to take all of us in order to do it. And so with that said, the builder that we're going to study today is a guy by the name of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah had this incredible ability to, to rally God's people around this, this cause to, to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, or you could say the local church. And as we study his story, we're going to learn how we can build the local church together. Everybody say together. Now, as we kind of dive into the message today, uh, the principles that I'm going to be talking about actually apply to anything that we're building in our lives. If we're building a marriage, if we're building a family, if we're building a business or we hope to, to start a business in the future, if we'll apply these principles uh, to whatever it is that we're building, it's going to set us up for Success. Now, I'm going to be specifically talking about building the local church today because there is nothing, I believe there is nothing greater that we can do with our lives than build God's house. And when we grab a hold of that truth, when we grab a hold of that reality, man, everything else kind of pales into comparison of building the local church together. Also, too, I was just thinking this morning as I was praying for our time together, and I thought, maybe you're new to church. Maybe, maybe, you've, maybe you've never been taught this. Maybe you've been in church for many years, but, but we've fallen into the, the Western mindset that, that church is about us. That, 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 that church is just coming on a Sunday morning, listening to a nice sermon, and going out to, to eat together. That church is, a, is more of a consumer product. But how many of us know God has a mission for his church? He has a mission for his body. And so today I want all of us to grab, whether you've been in church for five minutes or 50 years, that we would grab a hold of the reality. This is what the church should look like. And this is what we should all be doing as the body of Christ together. 
here. Why? Because the church is the hope of the world. It's going to take all of us to do it. And so as we study the builder Nehemiah, let me just give us five principles on how we can build the local church together. If you're taking notes, uh, the first principle that we need to have is, is, number one, is we need to bear the burden. That we have to bear the burden together. What's a burden? A, a, a burden, how many know a burden will keep you up at night? A, a burden will consume you. A, a burden will, will lay heavy upon your heart. A burden will take your appetite away. A, a burden becomes a priority to us. And how many of us know that God wants to put a burden in our hearts to build the local church? That God wants to put something on the inside of us that says, man, whatever I can do to build God's house, I'm going to do it. See, for, for Nehemiah, before he ever built anything for God, he first had to have a, a burden for it. And just to give us a little context as to Nehemiah's story, he he grew up, or he, was, he lived, I should say, in a, in a time when God's people were exiled uh, from, their, from their homeland of Israel, of Jerusalem. And he was a cupbearer to the king of, of Persia. And during this time, God's, God's people had been conquered in, in battle by the Babylonians. They had been taken captive, and, and they had lived in captivity under the Babylonians for 140 years. It's a long time, 140 years. And, and after that time period, the, the, the king of Babylonia allowed some of the Israelites, some of God's people to return to their homeland of Israel, of Jerusalem, and start kind of rebuilding the city and getting back to building their, 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 their people and their culture and all that. And so uh, Nehemiah obviously has a heart for his people. And so he inquires one day, How, how's it going back in my homeland? He, he lived in, in Persia of uh, about a thousand miles away from Jerusalem. So he's inquiring, man, how, how's the people doing? How, how's everything going? And, and he learns that, that God's people aren't doing well and that they are suffering. And immediately as Nehemiah hears this, this news, the, the Bible tells us that he's, he's brokenhearted. And he gets this burden in his heart that he has to do something. Let's take a look at it, Nehemiah chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, and Nehemiah is asking some of his, his Jewish brothers, and he's, he's asking them, how are our people doing back in Jerusalem? And they said to me in verse 3, those who survived the, the exile are, are back in the province, and they're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is, is, is broken down, and its gates have been buried with fire. And Nehemiah talking to us, writing the book, he said, when I heard these things, what did he do? I, I sat down and... And wept. For some days I, I mourned and I fasted and, and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah had this burden in his heart, something that weighed heavy upon him, something that kept him up at night, something that he was preoccupied with, something that he was passionate about, something that he was consumed with, something that was important to him. My question for us today as the body of Christ, as followers of Jesus, man, what burdens us today? What weighs heavy upon our hearts throughout the week? Because if you're anything like me, I've fallen into the trap of just going throughout my, my week and my day and my work and never even thinking about living on mission, never even thinking about building God's house, never even thinking about building God's kingdom. I've just become so consumed with my world, good things, not even bad things, consumed with my kids, consumed with volleyball practice and baseball practice and school, consumed with just my life that I've lost sight of something that God wants to put in my heart, which is a burden to build his house. And I was thinking about that, that God, God wants to put a, a burden to build his house in our hearts. And I was thinking about some of the, some of the reasons why I'm, I'm passionate. I was thinking about some of the reasons why I'm, I'm burdened to, to build God's house. And you might think, well, you're the pastor. You have to be it's like required. It's on the line when you sign the pastor certificate. You have to have a burden to build God's house. But I want you to know today that's not why I have a burden to build God's house. You might say, well, you planted, you planted Experience Church, and so since you kind of founded it, that's probably why you have such a burden for, to build God's house. But, but the truth is the reason why I have a burden to build God's house is because I, I encountered God in God's house. 
I, I, I found hope in God's house. I found forgiveness in God's house. I found freedom in God's house. I, I, found, I found purpose and meaning in God's house. I found real friendships in God's house. I found community in God's house. My life was forever changed in God's house. And because what God did in me, in his house, I have a burden and I have a passion that other people would walk through these doors and they would do the same exact thing in their lives too. And their lives would never be the same. As followers of Christ, man, we have to bear the burden together. Can't, it's not just me. It's not just ye. It's we together bearing this burden to build God's house. Why? Because the local church is the hope of the world. This isn't our idea. This was God's idea. He set it up to use flawed, messed up people to showcase his grace to the world who needs hope, who needs redemption, building God's house. And by the way, when I say local church, I'm not just talking about experienced church. I'm talking about the big C church, which is why I'm so fired up about tonight and in our third defiance united with 13 churches coming together to worship the name that's above every single name. And we started this thing back in January and tonight is, is our third one. It's the first time another church is hosting it over at Family Christian Center, which I'm so fired up about. And because the pastors in this community told me that something like this has not happened in over 20 years. 20 years, but now today, this year, with everything going on, man, churches are coming together and we're building the local church because the local church is the hope of the world. All right, so second principle we need to have after we get this burden is, is number two is we need to seek God faithfully. God puts a burden in our hearts. We're bearing this burden together. God, we encounter something in God's house. We have a passion to build God's house. What's our next step? Man, get on our face and seek God faithfully. What, what, what did Nehemiah do after God gave him this, this burden to rebuild God's house? He mourned, he fasted, and he prayed again and again and again. We'll see Nehemiah going before God praying and then praying some more and then praying some more and then praying again. 12 different times Nehemiah goes before God and he cries out to heaven. In fact, as you study the text, you, you discover that, that Nehemiah first learned about the, his people suffering in Jerusalem in the, in the Hebrew month of, of Kislev, which is right around our no, November, December time frame. And the Bible tells us that he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed all the way until the Hebrew month of Nisan. Now, if you don't think I have about five dad jokes for the word Nisan, you have not been coming to experience church for very long. I just want you to know that. But I'm going to leave those. I'm going to set those aside. I'm going to leave them alone today. And, and the, uh, the Hebrew month of Nisan would be right around the, the March-April time frame. In other words, for four months. Four months, Nehemiah prayed. For four months, he mourned. For four months, he fasted. And he got on his face and he cried out. God gave him a burden. And for four months, he got on his face. Why, why is he doing that? Because before we step out to build anything for God, we want to make sure we have his blessing on it. Before I step out and build anything for God, how I many know I need his blessing? Before we build a business, I need God's best blessing. Before I build a family, I want his blessing. Before I build a marriage, I need God's blessing. Before we build God's house, how many know we need God's blessing? There's, there's power. How many know there's power in prayer? I, 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 want to, I want to remind us today that this church is built on prayer. In fact, we, we launched the church in September of, uh, of 2012, but in January of 2012, when God put this burden in our hearts to build the local church and plant Experience Church, you know what we did? We took the first three weeks, and for 21 days, we fasted, and we prayed, and we cried out to the creator of the universe, because we don't want to build anything unless, God, you bless it. If you're not, if you're not with us, God, we don't want to do it. We're going to seek God faithfully. And before Nehemiah could leave Persia and travel a thousand, over a thousand miles back to Jerusalem, how I many know he would, need the, he would need the king's blessing in order to do it? 
Well, what's interesting in this time period and with these kings uh, is that you, you were not really allowed or supposed to bring any bad news to the king. You weren't supposed to be sad in his presence. You weren't supposed to be downcast or depressed. You were only supposed to bring him good news and be joyful whenever you were in the king's presence. And so here, Nehemiah has this burden, this thing that's weighing heavy upon his heart, but, but he's, he's not supposed to take this before the king. He's not even supposed to act sad in the king's presence. And so as he's praying, he's in this predicament. And so let's take a look at what happens in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. Nehemiah talking to us, he said, I had not been sad in his, the king's, presence ever before. And the king asked me, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> Fellas, we never want to ask our wives that, right? <laughs> Just never, I tried it once. It, it, no, it doesn't. Didn't go like I thought it would go in my head. Why does your face look so sad when, when you're not ill? When, there, when there's nothing wrong with you physically, this can be nothing but sadness of heart. And what's Nehemiah's response? I was very much afraid. I'm not even supposed to be having this conversation. I'm taking a little bit of a risk here. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it that you want? How many know we have a God in heaven who's asking us the same question today? What is it that you want? And what's Nehemiah's response? Let me pray about that. <laughs> Let me get it back on my face. And then I prayed to the God of heaven. God, help. God, give me the right words. Give me wisdom. God, direct my steps. God, God, show me what to do. God, show me what to say. Nehemiah is seeking God faithfully in prayer. And if we're going to build a local church together, how many know we need to do the same thing? We need to get on our face and cry out, God, if you're not in this place, Man, if you're not with us, God, we need your blessing. We need your presence. We need your power. We need your spirit. We need your wisdom. We need your direction. We need your help, God. This is your idea. Help us, God. Give us the wisdom to build your house. And so we get a burden, and we seek God faithfully. And the third kind of principle we need in building the local church is number three, is we need to develop a strategy. You see, for most people, when it comes to Whatever it is that they're building, it's not a lack of caring that's our problem. It's a lack of clarity. That we haven't defined and developed a strategy to build what we're trying to do. And when it comes to, to building the local church, when it comes to building this house, I want, I want us to know that we're not just launching out and, and trying to build this thing with no strategy. You know what the Bible calls that? The Bible calls that zeal without knowledge. Zeal without knowledge. Instead, how I many we got a plan? We have a strategy and we've thought about things ahead of time to set us up for success. For Nehemiah, let's take a look at his strategy, the strategy that he lays out before the king. Remember, the king asked him, what is it that you want? And then his next step was, let me pray about it. And then now he's going to, he developed a strategy with heaven and now he's given it to the king. Nehemiah chapter two, verse five. Nehemiah says, I replied, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. He said, I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls. Oh, yeah, and I'm building a house for me, a little shack, a little mansion for me too, king. And the king granted these requests. Why? Why did the king grant it? Because the gracious hand of God was on me. Because God gave me this burden and I got on my face because I don't want to make a move until God gives me the blessing, until his hand's upon me, until his favor is going before me. And as I develop a strategy, as I come up with a plan, as I step out, you know what he recognizes? I, I'm not building this. God's blessing it. 
God's blessing my steps. God's, God's presence, God's hand is on this. I hope we can recognize that God's hand is on this place. I hope we can just take a step back and realize that what we're experiencing in this place isn't happening everywhere else. I talk to church planners all over the nation, and many of them are not seeing God do what we're, we're seeing God do. They're not seeing salvations. They're not seeing, we were in a YMCA. Come on, somebody. Which we love that place. We love the Y. We love Rich and, and the partnership and how God used that place. Who would have thought we'd be in a mall? Not this guy, but God did. And God just keeps blessing it and directing our steps. What, what God's doing around here is not normal. Why? Because his gracious hand is on us. We just keep seeking him. He's just put this burden in our heart, and I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know how the next 30 years, I'm just going to keep taking on my next step. How many know that's a great strategy? Let me just do the next thing right. You don't know what to do in, in, in your situation, in your business, in your circle. Just do the next thing right. Just take your next step. Just do the next right thing. And then as God shows you, just do the next right thing, and the next right thing, and the next right thing. And next, next thing you know, you'll be in a mall next to hot rice. This is how it goes down. But here we see Nehemiah was strategic. Nehemiah had a plan. Ne Nehemiah hadn't even left Persia yet. And he had already thought about things ahead of time. I'm going to need some timber. I'm going to need some protection. I'm, I'm going to need some provision. I'm going to need some resource. He's not even left the, the king's side yet. He's got a, a strategy. He's got a He's got a plan. You know what's interesting? I didn't have time to put it in our notes, but then you get to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 15, and, and what happens is when Nehemiah finally gets to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that he gets there at night when it was still dark out. And you know the first thing that he does? He grabs a torch, and he heads out to the wall to inspect it, and he starts assessing the situation at night. How bad is it? What, what, what's really destroyed? What parts of the wall can we, can we salvage? How much manpower is this thing going to take? How much resource are we going to need? How long is this process going to be? He's assessing the situation and he's developing a strategy. Oh, and by the way, how many of us know he has an urgency too? Because they're exposed, right? The wall is, is, is broken down. The city gate's been burned. They're, they're, the, God's people is exposed and they're vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. And so he has this urgency to rebuild God's house. How many of us know we need an urgency in this place? We need an urgency to, to win souls. You know, I was blown away. I was inspired by our students this, this past week at, at Converge on Wednesday night when our students come together for a night of worship. And I just heard of one story that happened this past Wednesday of, of one of our students has been kind of reaching out to someone that's on their, their team, somebody that they kind of don't even get along with, but, but they're, tr they're trying to they have an urgency. They have a heart, they have a burden for this person. And so they started becoming a friend with them and loving on them. And the family doesn't go to church church and and so they they invited their teammate to, to converge youth night this past Wednesday and they came and they hung out and when they were leaving they jumped in the car and they they asked they asked their, their, their teammate how was it what do you think you know the question what do you think and they said their response was I had one of the best experiences of my entire life this is a student saying this they said, they said, something weird happened to me tonight. Like I, like I felt something like in my, I was, something was different. I, I don't even know how to explain it. And, and our student goes, that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that was the Holy Spirit you felt. And their response was, I think my life was changed forever tonight. How many of we can take a page out of our student's playbook? That we have this urgency. Well, every Sunday morning, whatever we're doing, man, we would reach out and people would encounter God. There's an urgency to us to build God's house. I mean, we don't have time to, to be passive or procrastinate. Heaven and hell are on the line. People's lives are at stake. We must have an urgency to build God's kingdom, to build the local church together. And so what's our strategy? 
here to build the local church? Well, let me just give it to us real quick. Our, our strategy is, is four steps. Number one, to know God. I mean, we want people who don't know God to know God. I'm not talking about just knowing about him, a head knowledge. I'm talking about knowing him in our hearts, having a relationship with him. We want people who don't have a relationship with God to have a relationship with God. And we want those of us that do have a relationship with God to have a better relationship with us, to know him better. That's our first step. Our second step is that we want people to find freedom. Freedom happens in the context of, of relationships. This is why small groups are so important to us, that, 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 that we find freedom as we grow deeper in our relationships with one another, and we find freedom when we grow deeper in our relationship with him. It's called discipleship, and that happens in our small groups. So we want people to know God, we want people to, to find freedom, and then we want people to discover their purpose. How many, how many know your design reveals your destiny? Come on, talk to me, church. That I, I, I know why I exist. I discover my, my purpose. I know mean, God's put gifts and passions and personalities and things inside. I believe there are some things sitting in this room that have gone dormant or have not been brought to life yet that God wants to breathe on that, that it would come, that would bloom and go, man, I didn't even know this gift was in me. And now God's using it to go to the fourth step, which is to make a difference. This is our dream team. These are our volunteers. Those of us that we've, we're just locking arms to build the local church. Whether we know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And so my question is, where are you at on that process? Where are you at in that strategy? Uh, do you know God? Are you in a small group finding freedom? Are you jumping into a small group? Oh, yeah, by the way, small group directory launches today. Come on, somebody. I'd like to real quickly put a plug in for my group, fellas, just so you can sign up. just want you to know. We're going to be talking about the real God, not, not who you think God is, not who you heard God is. No, who God really is. I want to know him for real. Man, we get, are we getting into a small group? Have we gone through Connect Track and discovered our purpose? Have we found a place on the team? Are we locking arms to build the local church together? Why? Because the local church is the hope of the world. And the fourth principle as we keep moving today. I know some of y'all got a little leery when I said five principles. You're like, ooh, we're going to be here a while. We're going to work into second service. <laughs> Fourth principle we need to, to build the local church together is, is number four is we need to work in unity. We need to work in unity. Everybody say unity. unity. You see, after we have a strategy, we must have Unity. I could camp out on this principle the rest of the time. I'm not going to do that, but I want you to know that's how important unity is. And unity isn't just the absence of conflict. Unity is the presence of strategy. Unity means that we're all pulling in the same direction. We're all working towards the same goal. Like, like we, all, we all have the same focus. We all have the sa- our eye on the target, and we're all working together to accomplish the burden God has placed in our hearts to build the local church. Because how many of us know, you know, you know what destroys uh, businesses, teams, organizations, families? You know what destroys churches? Disunity. The Bible tells us that, that a house divided against itself will not stand. When there's strife in this house, when there's gossip in this house, when there's slander in this house, I mean, when we're talking bad about one another or the leadership, when we're grumbling and when we're complaining in this house, how many of us know we're tearing down the very thing God's called us to build? We're working against God, not with him. And so we, we got to protect the unity of the house. How many of the enemy of our soul wants to steal, kill, and destroy? Just look around at our nation. It's the same thing, just different, different subject to divide us. What side are you on? You on this side, that side? You on the math side, not math side? You on the black side, the not black side? You on the vaccinated side, not? Let me just do it. It's the same message to divide us. Got to protect the unity. If we're going to build this house, we've got to protect the unity of this house. 
And Nehemiah, he knew that. He knew there was no way he was going to be able to rebuild the wall by himself. He knew that it was going to take an army. It was going to have to take an army. It was going to take every single person working together in unity to rebuild the wall together. And I'm just saying today, it's going to take every single one of us working in unity to build the local church, to build God's house. Take a look at it, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Nehemiah said, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we're in. I love how real and authentic, Nehemiah didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't, he didn't pretend there wasn't a problem. He looked at everyone around him. He looked at God's people and said, we're in a bad situation. Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how, how the hand of my God had, had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And take a look at their response. I'm praying it's our response today. Then they said, let us arise and build. Let us arise and build. Let us arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. How many of us know God has a much bigger plan and purpose for each and every one of us than just coming into a building and sitting in a row listening to a, a, a sermon every single week? The whole reason we gather together isn't just to be encouraged, it's to be inspired to live out the mission that God has placed upon us. And I want you to understand, I want us to know that, that other people can't live out your mission for you. Only you can live out your mission. Much like a, a team, how, how many of the quarterback can't be the lineman too? He's got his own job to do. He can't do the lineman's job for him. He needs the lineman to do the job. It's part of a team, right? Other people can't do your mission for you. That we, in other words, we all have a hole in front of us with our name on it. And the question is, will we start rebuilding it? Let me ask it this way. There's a wall that needs built called the local church. Is anyone willing to rise up and build it today? Is anyone willing to rise up and build? Let us arise and build. Arise and build. In fact, let me say it this way. A great church is not built on the gifts of a few, but on the sacrifices of many. A great church isn't built on, on the gifts of just a few people. No, on the sacrifices of many. Why? Because it takes all of us. So I want to challenge us today to respond to the word of the Lord, to jump in, to lock arms with one another and build the local church together, to build God's house together. And if God would stir you, here, here's a next step for you. Right now, you can text XC to serve, XC serve to 94,000 and we'll send you your next steps. I'm all about next steps. I'm all about, you know what? I'll do it. No, I'll go. God, you said it. All I need to hear is your voice. If you said to God, how many know God loves simple obedience? I don't need to figure it out. I don't need to make sense of it. God, if you said it, it's done. It isn't that what the Roman soldier did with Jesus? I have this servant whom I love, whom I care about, who's homesick, he's dying, and Jesus said, let, let me go with you. And the, the Roman soldier said, no, no, I'm a man of authority. I give the order to my soldiers, I just know when I give the order, it's gonna be done. All you have to do is say the word, Jesus, and it will be done. And Jesus said, never have I seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. That's what he's looking for today. You know what? You said to God, it's done. I'm doing it. Where do I sign up? I want everybody to get a hold of this. A great church is not built on the gifts of a few, but on the sacrifices of many. Whether we're in the back row today or watching online, listen, for some of us watching online right now, it's time to get back in God's house. You know why? Because we can't build the local church together in our living rooms. It's time to come back to the local church and live on mission and live on point and fulfill the, the mission, the assignment that God has given to us. You might be here this morning and you might be thinking, man, we're just visiting. Like this, this is our first time. You know, I just believe God brought you here and he's given you a shovel. Let's get to work. Let's go to work. 
You might say, well, I just came for a word of encouragement, Pastor. Yeah, well, you get a shovel, right? <laughs> I, just came for a, I, just, I just came to get a word from the Lord. Well, he's given you a job to do, right? He's got, he's got something for you to do. How, how many of us know you, you might come to church looking for a word? God wants to give you an assignment. And I'm not just, talk, I'm not just talking God giving us assignment for Sunday mornings, but that we would live our lives on assignment. Everywhere we go, going into our schools, I'm going on assignment. Going into my workplace, I'm going in on assignment. That business you started, that, that's not just for you to, to retire, uh, uh, have an easy retirement someday and for your family to live comfortably. No, God wants to use your business to build his kingdom. God wants to use your leadership. God wants to use your influence that every single one of us would live every day on assignment to build God's kingdom together. Here, let me say it like this. We have to stop seeing church as something that we do on the side. We have to stop seeing church as something we do just on Sunday mornings. No, we're building God's kingdom in every aspect of our lives because we're living on assignment. I'm living on mission. It's a priority to us because a local church is the hope of the world. We're building it together. It's gonna take all of us in order to do it. And finally today, the, the fifth principle that we need to embrace to build a local church together is number five, is to prepare for opposition. Prepare for opposition. You see, you see, when we begin to take souls, as people begin to get saved and the kingdom of darkness starts to lose power, when we begin to step out and to step up to build God's kingdom and build God's house and the walls start to go up, how many of us know the enemy will try to come in against us? Let me say it like this. Don't be surprised when you face opposition. Be surprised when you don't face it. Because if we don't have any adversity in our lives today, there's a good chance that what we're living for doesn't really matter. Nehemiah chapter 4. Is this too harsh? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1 says this. Sambalot was very angry when he, heard, he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian off army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can, they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah, the, the Ammonite who was standing beside him, he started chiming in and he remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Nehemiah, God's people, they're building this wall and here comes these guys throwing out all these insults at them. And when we start shaking the kingdom of darkness and the enemy starts to come against us, we need to make sure that we're ready for it. That we're not taken by surprise. That I, I don't start questioning, man, what's happening? Why is this? Why am I going through adversity? Why am I face opposition? No, I knew this was coming. I knew this was going to happen. I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm prepared. We need to have each other's back. We need to be unified. We need to be ready for the battle and the opposition that's before us. We need to be on our faces crying out to the creator of the universe for his hand of protection to be not just on uh, me, on we, all of us. Take a look how Nehemiah responds as we, we close today to the opposition. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. Nehemiah responds. I, I love this. You know how Nehemiah responds? He doesn't even talk to the haters. He doesn't even respond to those who are, are talking trash and telling them that they can't do it. You know, he looks at God's people. He looks at God's people and he says... Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. And fight for your homes. You know what Nehemiah does? He brings them back to the very first principle. Why did we do this in the first place? 
Why did we start this thing in the first place? He brings them all the way. Why would we build the local church and be so passionate about it? Because I found God in this place. Because my life was changed in God's house. I found forgiveness in God's house. I found freedom in God's house. I found victory in God's house. I found hope in God's house. He brings them all. Remember the Lord. Remember why we started this thing. Let the Lord be the lifter of your eyes. Remember how great and awesome. Remember how he parted the Red Sea and our ancestors walked over on dry ground. Remember how they turned around and they watched Pharaoh and all their enemies pursue them and God caused the sea to collapse on them, taking their enemies out right in front of them. Remember how God provided for us manna in the wilderness. Remember how God was with Joshua as they crossed the Jordan and they defeated 31 kings to take possession of the promised land. Remember the Lord. Remember the goodness of our God. Remember his faithfulness that the God God who got us here will get us there. The God who did it for us will do it for others. He takes them all the way back to the burden. He says, this is why. This is why we're doing it. Church, this is why we exist. So that others could encounter God the way we did and never be the same. More souls. What if more marriages could be healed in this place? What if more prodigal sons and daughters could come back home in this place? What if, what if more addicts could find the freedom of Jesus in this place? What if God would continue to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could think, ask, or imagine in this place? I'm believing that, I'm believing that revival is coming to this community. I'm, belie I'm believing this building isn't big enough for what God wants to do in this place. I'm believing that there's more souls, more lives. God's doing some incredible things. And so let's, let's pray today as we respond to the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this example. We thank you for this builder, Nehemiah, and everything that we can learn from him. And right now, as we're praying together, Maybe right now you're facing some opposition in your life. Maybe there's a battle that you're in. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your heart, but you're, you're facing some, some opposition. I want to speak this. If that's you, would you just lift your hand right now? Man, I'm going through something. I'm facing some opposition. I'm facing some struggle. See, when you're lifting your hand, you're acknowledging it to the Lord. You're acknowledging the adversity. You're acknowledging the struggle. Let me speak this over you. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Remember the goodness of your God. Remember his faithfulness in your past. Remember where he's brought you from. Remember the miracles that he's already done in your life. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. And as you do, Father, I pray that faith would arise in us. Hope would arise, strength would, strength would arise. That you bring times of refreshing to our souls. A new vision, a new purpose, a new strategy. God, fill our homes, fill our families, fill our children, God. Fill our schools, God. Fill our hearts, our marriages, God. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. You could do it, God. God, I pray that you would strengthen your sons and daughters today who are facing a battle, an opposition, adversity. We're not shocked by it. God, I pray that you would help them to set their face like flint. That we're not running from the storm, we're running through it. We're not, we're not retreating, we're putting our head down and we're trusting God. Because your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God, we trust in the faithfulness of our God. We don't trust in circumstances or situations. We don't, some put their hope in chariots. Some put their, their hope in, in kings. No, we put our hope in the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We'll trust you through the storm. We'll trust you through the opposition. And we'll give you all the glory. 
as we continue praying together today, maybe, maybe some of us are here and as we talk about knowing God, having a relationship with him, maybe, maybe you would say, man, you're on the, kind of on the edge looking in. Maybe you're watching this message right now. Maybe you come to church, but you've never surrendered your life. Surrendering your life means, God, you call the shots. I live the way you want me to live. And even right now, maybe you're facing some opposition where the enemy would love to speak to you like, you you don't need that. You don't need to do that. But right now, by faith, you say, you know what, God, I need you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. And I don't want to just talk about it. I don't want to just go through the motions. I want to experience the power, the joy, the victory, the freedom, the life that only you have for me. So right where you're at, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you lift your hand and say, here I am, God. Here's my life. Here's my heart. Change me today in this place. Just like that student this past week. I want to encounter your love and never be the same. I want to encounter your grace and your presence and never be the same. And right now, I lift my hand as a sign of surrender to your love. And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who paid the price for my sin on the cross. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for being patient with me. And right now, God, here's my heart. Forgive me, change me, fill me, restore me. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, let's give God some praise.